So good afternoon, everyone. It's just 12 o'clock and today's episode is number 120, Whitetail Fawn Research. Uh, we've got Tyler Obermiller, a um, biologist down in the southern part of Minnesota. And when we went through the practice session, guys, there was a lot of really cool stuff that he covered. So Tyler, why don't you tell the folks a little bit about yourself and you can go ahead and get your presentation started. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Tyler Obermuller and I work for the Minnesota DNR Wildlife Research. Uh, specifically, I work out of the Farmland Research Group as a deer biologist and the lead for the Fawn Survival and Movement Study in Southern Minnesota. So my job as a wildlife biologist is to study different aspects of deer ecology, such as survival, uh, causes of mortality, habitat selection and movement, and then help inform management objectives, whether through hunting limits or actual habitat management. Uh, so more specifically, I'll get some seasonal survival estimates for our population model to help set harvest limits or I'll identify different causes of mortality and then give this information to our management team and then they can make those um, for their management decisions. Uh, but before beginning or before examining these different questions, we wanted to determine whether we could find a more effective way of locating newborn fawns in our study area. And that led us to drones with thermal infrared. So the way we decided to um, try drones was interesting. We saw a crew from Ducks Unlimited using a drone for their work and asked for a quick demo. Uh, they took us out on the grassland area and launched the drone and we quickly saw a doe like this with a thermal camera and we immediately saw uh, we had a lot of potential. Uh, this image for um, just everyone watching is a, a bedded doe, a fawn right next to it and actually another uh, fawn twin in the bottom left. Um, so then in 2019, we conducted a pilot or a test study to assess how well drones can locate fawns. In 2020, we planned to begin our survival movement study, but COVID-19 delayed us um, that field season. So we um, further were able to take our drone out and evaluate and improve the methodology. And then in 2021, we began our, our full study and GPS card 75 fawns. And then in 2022, uh, 82 fawns. And then last spring, uh, just a month ago, we um, GPS collared 104 fawns uh, for survival movement monitoring. So drones are becoming very popular in wildlife research. Uh, they've been used to identify marine mammals, um, monitor for rhinoceros poaching, locate chimpanzee nests, estimate colony sizes of penguins. Uh, they've also been used to estimate many ungulate populations, such as moose, bison, elk, and deer. Uh, but drones have never been used to locate wildlife for capture. Uh, so then in 2019, we began this study uh, to determine the ability of this method. Now for um, locating fawns, there are a couple of historical options. Uh, first is opportunistic captures, which is just getting a large number of people walking and flying habitat areas for fawns. But this requires a large number of people and coordination. It's not very efficient and it requires a lot of effort because you are um, literally going out in grassland areas and just walking all day looking for fawns, and that can be a, a tiring endeavor. Uh, we also use doe behavior methods, which is looking at GPS collared does uh, locations or vaginal implant transmitters, uh, which are temperature sensitive transmitters placed in the vaginal canal of pregnant does. And then at um, uh, when the transmitter is expelled during birth, we know that birth has occurred. Uh, but these methods still require fawn searches, and they also require adult capture. Uh, which can be expensive and unnecessary if we don't have specific objectives uh, for those adults. So briefly, uh, we're conducting our study in the heavily row crop area of southern Minnesota. 71% of our area is row crops, uh, so corn or soybeans, 12% is grasslands, 7% is urban or developed land, 5% wetlands, 3% forest, and 2% open water. So heavily um, agricultural. We conducted all of our flights on public wildlife management areas shown in green. We wanted to focus our, on areas where the most fawns would be present. So we determined suitability of these wildlife management areas by analyzing aerial photos and also visiting many of these um, sites uh, to further evaluate them. We were looking for mostly grassland, lightly forested areas, as well as some scrub shrub or upland wetlands. We admitted areas with open water and immersion wetlands. For the drone, we used the DJI Matrice 300 RTK. Um, it was able to handle a large camera as seen here. And the big thing here is it has the thermal camera and the color camera in the same um, device, the DJI H22T. And in our first couple of years, we actually had two separate cameras, one thermal and one color, 
um, on the on the drone, and that allowed a little bit of more difficulty to transition between those cameras. So with this camera, it was just seamless. We were able to go right from thermal to color um, images to locate the signature and then locate the um, what the signature was in the color from the camera. And I'll show a video like that of that in a little bit. At each wildlife management area, we would set up an unmanned aerial system, which was just the landing pad, drone, controller, batteries. We also attached another computer monitor as shown there. So the controller, um, uh, we attached it to the controller so more of the biologists could locate those signatures. We quickly learned that sunlight was an issue. Uh, so we started early in the morning to avoid sunlight and allow us more flight time before that ground became too warm. And we lost that temperature gradient difference between the fawn and the, the ground. Additionally, we had issues with charging batteries, uh, so we use a gas power generator to efficiently charge those batteries out in the field. So at each uh, suitable wildlife management area, the drone contractor developed a pre-programmed flight path as shown here. So when we were conducting our flights, our contractor would manually drive to the start point and then begin that automatic flight. And then when they located a signature, uh, he would pause from that flight and manually direct the drone uh, to the fawn to determine the signature. Here's uh, one right there. There's actually the thermal image of the fawn. So we're on that pre-programmed flight. He's now pausing from that pre-programmed flight and he's gonna manually direct down to that drone, or down to that signature so we can confirm it. The pink uh, color shows really good conditions. Uh, that's cool color, the orange is bright, that's the fawn. And the darker images are even cooler image. So it might be some wet, wetter areas that um, are cooler. So this is the thermal image and then we'll jump to the color image and we have a fawn there. So it does a split screen and then we zoom in and we can confirm that fawn. There's just the image uh, circled on the left showing the thermal. Here's another fawn that we've located, uh, the fawn in the middle. The doe is actually, the mother is actually in the top left and the twin is down there in the bottom center. This is a, a fawn and mother we saw nursing. You see the thermal images, they're showing up bright. So this was, you know, during the day starting to get a little brighter and we're already seeing as that sun comes out, the, um, the ground is starting to heat up pretty quickly, but still uh, plenty, plenty uh, good condition up for us to, to locate fawns. One more, uh, that's actually water in the bottom there, wetlands and water, so that was actually showing up brighter. And then we confirm identification by modifying the zoom scale of the camera rather than adjusting the actual flight altitude of the drone. And this just allowed us to reduce auditory stress to the animal. Uh, we found this to be effective. We only had a couple of cases, four cases in our first three years, uh, identifying well over 200 animals where um, three of the cases, the fawn lifted up the, its head and one case the fawn actually did to get up. Um, and that was in 2020 when we were flying later. Um, so that fawn was much older. So. But internally, we, we saw a great success with um, not disturbing the fawn. And we acknowledge that the fawn could be internally stressed, but we still think it's good that they weren't running away um, in almost all of the cases. So when we confirm a fawn, the contractor takes a thermal and color picture of the fawn. It also records the location either to us for actually going out in the field and, and locating that fawn. Uh, this worked really well because the capture crew was often um, behind the drone crew. Um, so the person watch, watching for the computer monitor would just upload a point. And we had a shared Google Maps layer and the capture crew would come on our phone and we could, you know, do one after the other, um, ramp the location and just go to the next, um, next one. So after recording the location, the DNR staff would record whether the doe was present, whether the fawn made any response to the drone, and the obstruction, which was how um, obstructed the fawn was using the color image. And so that, and the reason we did that is we just wanna see how covered was this fawn, even though we were able to detect it with the drone. So jumping to some results, uh, in 2021, we GPS colored 75 fawns, 22, 82 fawns. In the last year, we um, GPS colored 104 fawns, or this last spring, sorry. And lastly, I, I wanted to compare our method versus historical um, fawn location methods. Uh, I'm just going to use the first couple of years because at this point, we don't have all our data entered and analyzed um, from this past spring. Um, but we've, um, but what I want to say is we first did it using per person hours, and that's how we measured efficiency. And that's just a common measure uh, used in wildlife ecology for effort. It's just the total hours worked uh, between all the people compared to the total number of fawns we found. 
So for example, if we have four people working four hours, that is 16 total working hours. And if we locate four fonds during that time, we just take 16 divided by four, and we have four person hours per color fond. So in 2021, we had 3.1. In 2022, we had 2.4 person hours per color fond. Now, what does all that mean? The values aren't that important, um, but what it is really important is comparing those to those historical methods that I mentioned in the very beginning. So for now, for opportunistic captures, um, a study reported eight to 10 person hours per fond. Um, ground searches, five to, four, uh, five to 214 person hours per fond, so very large. Um, Doe behavior was 60, VITS was 145. So we're seeing just uh, very large person hours um, for these different historical methods. Uh, additionally, we only had to use four to five people, one person flying the drone, one person locating those fond thermal signatures, and two to three people out capturing. So for opportunistic doe movement and even those vaginal implant transmitters, it takes a much larger crew. And additionally, in those latter two cases, they need to go also GPS collar adults. Um, additionally, um, that we found that was efficient, we we're also able to identify many other species, such as ducks. Uh, and this was a fun case where we could even make out each one of the chicks with a thermal image. So just take a quick second and see how many um, chicks you can count on this photo. Like I said, I don't have the thermal image, uh, but we could easily identify them. And there was 10 of them. So really hard to see, you know, even in the color image, but in the thermal image, those each little dots popped up pretty easily. Saw so pheasants, a uh, rooster and a hen on the right side. Bedded coyote, um, some coyote pups, muskrats. And lastly, this was kind of a fun one. Um, so this was a pack of raccoons. You can see the, the moms right there in the middle. And this was kind of a fun case because when you can see some of the thermal images of the fawns that I showed, we're looking for that circular image. Well, you can see this um, dead stump is circular. So when we were, you know, going up to it, we actually thought this was a fawn because uh, it had that nice circular shape, but it was not, but it was a kind of a, a fun find to have regardless. Another really interesting observation we found from using the drone is how fawns are selecting their bed sites. Uh, so we can see the adult doe is moving down here. The fawn is still um, up and moving around up there. Uh, so we found this fawn before sunrise. We only have the thermal image in this case, uh, but the fawn and doe were together nursing earlier, and then the doe quickly moved away so the fawn could pick its own bed site. And all the all the research has shown this in the past is not widely known, or has there been this kind of great visual evidence that these fawns are doing this. So the fawn is navigating the area to find a good place to hide away from predator detection, uh, and the mother is moving away to avoid bringing attention to the area uh, where that fawn is located. You know, the sooner they can nurse and she can move away, the less chance the coyote may key in on them and, and begin looking in that area. Now you can see that fawn is now bedded down. The mom's gonna quickly um, walk by, but uh, does not help them pick that location. Here's another case during the day. We again saw um, a fawn and a doe nursing earlier than the fawn moved on. You can see the fawn's right about the bed right around now. Um, now, the reason they're doing this is, is documented. Fawns are considered hiding species, where they're independently bedding away from their mother, hiding from potential predators. The mother is typically in the area, and if near, may uh, try to uh, flee or lure their predators toward them and away from their young. Although, in many cases, we do not see the doe present uh, when we're doing the captures. For example, for our, our th first three years of captures, the mother was present for only 28 to 32 percent of the time of fawn captures, and that's with a sample size of 261. Uh, so you can see in these beginning weeks, the fawn, uh, the mother is just not really around, really letting that fawn select its own bedside and um, relying on them to um, hide away from predators. So for those first couple weeks of life, uh, these fawns are by themselves, uh, besides a few feeding bouts each day, you know, remaining separate. And the fawn hidden may allow the best chance for this fawn to avoid predator detection until they're more mobile and able to defend themselves from predators. Uh, then when fawns are two to three weeks old, they start to transition to a following species where they are much more active and they're following their mother around. Now, instead of hiding from predators, they want to detect them and flee or run away from them. Additionally, because they are following their mother uh, more often, they can rely on them. Uh, they can rely on her for protection. And I often hear people uh, 
ton of instances where they find a fawn in the wild and, and fear that it's been abandoned. And so now, you know, using this evidence here in me, you can know, now know that that fawn is perfectly fine. You know, it selected that location for a very specific reason uh, and do not touch that animal or move it in that area because um, then you're actually putting that fawn at risk of re not, not reuniting with its mother. You know, when we capture all of our fawns, we're really careful to put it exactly where we found it um, in case that mother, or for when that mother comes back to nurse. So in summary for the drone part of this talk, uh, we found this capture method to be effective in the farmland region and most advantageous for our goals. Uh, we found this technique was limited by sunlight, but we were able to resolve this issue by conducting uh, flights at night or under cloudy conditions. I also think our study shows the importance of a pilot or a test study uh, where you determine the feasibility of this method before beginning your study um, and GPS coloring fonts. I think it would have been really difficult for us to call our 75 fonts and that first year really helped us figure out all the methodology. You know, what's the difference between a coyote and adult deer, um, raccoons, fawns, um, many different animals as well. So now let's move to the actual fawn study. Uh, I first want to touch on background and why we began the study in the first place. So Minnesota relies on a harvest-based projection model uh, to determine population size. And that just means we use past harvest amounts along with environmental and survival information to guide how we manage our deer and set harvest limits. In order for us to have a good model, we need to have updated survival information to accurately predict what is occurring on the landscape, hence updating fawn survival rates. Additionally, we haven't conducted a survival study in the farmland region since 2001, therefore our estimates could be markedly different. One of the reasons it could be different is coyote expansion, large increases in coyote density. Um, using some annual surveys that the DNR conducts each year, we've seen a 250% increase in coyote density um, from 2000 to 2020. Lastly, with all these things in mind, we want to better understand which spaces of our farmland moving or our farmland region they're occupying, how they're moving around our landscape um, during different seasons of the year and during di different life stages, uh, such as winter migration. Uh, when fawns are moving to better areas during winter uh, or spring dispersal when these fawns get to leave home and select their own place to live. So now we have some background on why we're conducting this work. Uh, we've seen how we located the fawn, uh, drones, uh, the fawns with the drones. That dr um, drone gave us me a location. That's me putting my hand, giving that uh, fawn to Michaela. Uh, and then we can go out and, and handle the animal. One of the first things we do uh, is put a blindfold on the fawn, and that just helps remain, uh, keep the fawn uh, calm during captures. Then we, what we do is we collect blood. We collect blood to look at potential deficiencies related to diet and energy exertion and stress. We also want to examine maternal antibody transfer or colostrum intake. And all that means is essentially, does the mother's milk have all the necessary nutrition to help protect the fawns from infections or disease? Next, we take hoof growth measurement to get an estimated age. You can see me taking it right now. So on that um, hoof is actually, as it grows, the hoof grows and it's actually a different, slightly different color. So I'm able to measure that, um, that hoof growth and that gets us an estimated age through an equation. Next, we take multiple morphological measurements, such as hind leg length, total body length, neck circumference, weight. And those are all just really good indicators of body size and survival. A lot of literature has shown that increased body size um, has increased survival. We're taking a rectal temperature. Um, after that, we will take uh, we'll take that weight in a bag. We'll then put an ear tag and a collar on that animal. You can see I put a flag down. We will come back uh, one to three days later and go to that site and take some bedside measurements. One of the reasons we don't take it right now is because we um, don't want to disturb the fawn anymore, right? We want to get out, get our information, but get it quickly and efficient, efficiently um, so that fawn can reunite um, with that mother as quickly as possible. So we fit each fawn with a small expandable GPS collar that weighs 138 grams or about a quarter of a pound uh, and averages about 3% of the body weight. Additionally, these fawn white tailed deer fawns grow quickly, quickly lowering that overall percentage of the weight of the fawn in the first week or two when they're larger remaining bedded um, during that hiding stage. Historically, researchers use very high frequency collars and that requires a person to go out and actually determine the location uh, with a beacon. It's like a device that you go out and it beeps and it beeps back to you and it gets louder when you get closer and, and you point in directions that are going to near the fawn. 
The, the disadvantage of this is you'll get less accurate locations. You'll get much fewer locations. Uh, also, typically these locations are only recorded during the day because you actually have to have someone go out there. Uh, so you're missing many of those important um, locations and activity data during the night. And also, you also need to constantly monitor for survival. So the expandable band that we have, or collar we have, records six locations per day, or takes a location every four hours. Uh, we could take more if we like, but with our objectives, we needed to conserve battery to get our collars to last until dispersal at 12 and 18 months of age. Importantly, we use these GPS, GPS collars to closely monitor survival and reduce our response time for mortality investigations. And that allows us to increase our ability to confidently identify that cause of mortality. So for us, the, the GPS caller is programmed to send a mortality text message and email when the caller has been still for eight hours. So each expandable band has three poles with increasing number of stitches as shown in the white lines and also increasing stitch strength uh, so the band can grow with the font's next size. So that first um, single line there at the top is just a single line of stitching. That'll be the first one to break. Um, then in late summer, or early fall, the second one will go, and that one just has two lines of stitching. And then the bottom one down here, closest to the collar, has two lines of stitching, but that stitching is actually backstitched, so it's extra strong, and that will not expand for um, quite some time, um, actually until probably the next spring or summer, depending on uh, the font's growth. That light um, brown fabric at the very top is a breakaway mechanism, and that de degrades with the environment um, during winter, rain, um, and at approximately 18 and 20, uh, 18 months to two years, it'll begin to tear and actually fall off. Um, it'll you know, then go into a mortality mode because the collar remains motionless. And then we'll deploy a team and retrieve that collar. And then we're able to download the location data. Because uh, at that point, we've met all our objectives. So now that we have this uh, font GPS card, we're computer monitoring these fonts daily to ensure they're alive. Uh, we receive one location per day. And if anything is looking suspicious, and if we believe that one has died or received a mortality text message alert, uh, we will then deploy a mortality uh, team to investigate. Upon arrival, we, we examine the immediate area where the caller was found for evidence of mortality. If we don't find anything there, we'll actually um, go back to previous locations and looking for different evidence. One of the first things we do if we find a mortality is we're examining the site for different characteristics, uh, primarily whether it was scavenged by a predator or it was actually killed by the predator. Uh, we search the area for other evidence, uh, such as predator hair, tracks, and scat. When possible, we also collect um, scat and take saliva swabs, um, swabbing these predators. Um, then we're able to take that and send that to a lab, and then they can identify the exact predator, and that can you know, allow us to increase our confidence in what, what we're defining as correct. If a mortality cause is unknown or appears to be health-related and sufficient carcass remains, We'll then deliver that carcass to the University of Minnesota for an necropsy or an autopsy, and they'll do it for a full necropsy and um, send samples in. It can give us a very accurate um, identification of what the health-related cause was. So in 2021, we GPS card 75 fawns, 38 males, 37 females. <clears throat> they weighed uh, on an average 9.9 .9 pounds, and we collared them on an average of 5.3 days of old. Uh, days of age. And in 2022, we GPS card 82 fawns, 49 males, 33 females, uh, a little lighter at 9.4 and younger at 3.3 days, which essentially means we just, um, the fawning season in 2022 was probably a little earlier um, than 21 because we, we generally collar at the same time or start at the same time each year. Two things I wanted to highlight is the large difference in sex ratio of male to females in 2022 of 82 fawns, 49 and 33, uh, quite different. And that is quite interesting and something I'll, I'll look at briefly with analysis later. And then just age, um, that could also play an important role where younger fawns tend to be um, more vulnerable to predation. So different causes of mortality, um, here's a bar graph. We had 26 mortalities in 2021, 17 coyote kills, five disease, three vehicle collision. And one other where it was an accident and actually fell in a ravine and got caught. In 2022, we had 47 mortalities, 36 coyote kills, four vehicle collision, four disease, and three hunter harvested. Uh, we did GPS collar eight more fawns um, between these first two years. 
Um, but if we, even if we do that, we crack for sample size, you know, 17 cattle kills, 36 uh, in 2022, we saw a 91% increase in predation from 2021 to 2022. Um, and we're still in the process of entering results from this past spring, um, but we are seeing some pretty high coyote numbers again this year. So I mentioned that um, sex ratio um, at the beginning of the results section. I wanna highlight the, the green circle that I have here. So in 2021, we actually saw more females. So yes to predation. So we saw 11 females be predated by coyotes in 2021 and only six female or six males. But if we jump to 2022, we actually saw 29 males and only five females be predated upon by um, uh, coyotes. So disproportionately more males were vulnerable to coyote predation in 2022. And that's kind of something inter interesting. We, we're gonna dive into activity, behavior, um, but some of the literature has suggested that male fawns tend to be more active. They tend to move around more. Um, and one negative is that may allow them to be more, you know, be seen more by um, coyote predation and then they can be detected and then um, killed. Um, but that is still something that's just a hypothesis. And that'll be something we can look at with the location and some different data we have um, recorded on the GPS scholars. Now let's jump to survival. Um, we see a large annual variation between years. In 2021, we had 85.6% survival. In 2022, we had 68.4. We jumped to three months survival. It went down to 78.1% and 55.2% in 2022. In six months of 71.8, 47.3. So what does all this mean? Well, going back, I mentioned we haven't conducted a, a study um, in since 2001. That study was conducted in Redwood Falls area, about an hour to the northwest of our study area, and they found a three-month survival of 87%. So we're seeing, even in 2021, lower, but much lower in 2022. Additionally, if we go back to a study done and conducted in northern Minnesota, where they have, you know, lynx, bobcat, bears, wolves, they saw a three-month survival of 57%, uh, and that was conducted in the early 2000s as well. So we're seeing, you know, Similar survival rates are even a little bit lower in 2022 than areas in, in northeastern Minnesota. So it's quite different um, and vastly different from what we were expecting before. So this is um, really interesting and also shows that we need additional years of data to kind of confirm these annual variations. Um, you can see these different, vastly different between the two years. High annual variation in juvenile survival may be important because they could play a large uh, factor in populate, population fluctuations. So now I'd like to just briefly um, talk, to about, talk about examining some movement information. Uh, these spawns have now survived the first summer and are much less vulnerable to predation, but now we're dealing with winter conditions. So deer often migrate to a new area during the winter. Uh, these areas provide more food, um, but they all provide more, harsh, or more cover from the harsh winter conditions. Notably down here in the farming region is wind and drifting snow. So this was a male fawn uh, that moved on December 12th moved 9.4 miles to the uh, north in that location of 76. And that 76 is just showing it's a cluster of 76 locations. So it's just a cluster of locations. And then spent the winter there and then moved back on April 10th, um, back to where it was uh, originally at the previous fall and where it was also captured at. So we have not run these analysis yet, but we're hoping to learn how uh, and where these fawns are moving across the landscape, you know, where they're stopping, what types of habitat they're available to move to, you know, with these changing landscapes, uh, we in general just don't have a good understanding of what they're selecting in the prairie region. Another important biological movement uh, deer fawns make are their dispersals. Dispersals often occur in the spring, um, but some also occur in the fall. And our one-year-old fawns moving away from their mother uh, in our own home range and selecting a new area to live. Uh, so the first year of their life, the mother and the fawn are together, but then the following spring, the mother pushes that fawn away to select its own home um, and also because that mother is likely going to give birth to a new fawn. So that fawn needs to push out the old fawn so it can kind of start the new journey. Uh, but depending on habitat availability uh, and with our region being predominantly agriculture, they may need to travel extended distances. And that could also guide future um, habitat management. Similar to migrations, we're interested in better understanding how they're moving, uh, how long they're taking to move, you know, where they're stopping, and how their new and old home range compares. 
These movements can sometimes be incredibly large. Uh, this male fawn moved in average or moved on May 5th and arrived on May 17th. Uh, so 12 day movement. This fawn moved an incredible 68.3 miles. Uh, and it was very conservative because we actually didn't receive this color back. It, it must have fell off or stopped functioning. So we were only receiving one location per day. Here's one more large dispersal. This is a male fawn that moved 92.3 miles on June 1st and arrived at its new location on June 10th. The large, this is the largest migration we found thus far. And we're excited to learn more about these movements because unfortunately, um, with a large predation uh, rate and also we're having many collars fall off, um, getting caught on fences. Uh, so we don't really actually have a large number of fawns that have made it to one year. Um, but we, we collared 104 fawns this past spring and we hope to get many more fawns um, to migration dispersal uh, to learn more about these movements. One last uh, interesting feature of these GPS collars is they record activity, uh, which is exactly as it sounds. It measures how active they are and how much they're moving when they're doing it. As you can see here with, with age on the bottom axis and then um, the vertical axis is just activity. Um, you can see it's at the first you know, two weeks of age, you can see it kind of remain flat, but then it really starts to increase here where I'm circled in orange and increase pretty precipitously until 40 to 50 days of age. And if we go back to when, we, when I first mentioned that hiding and following um, stage, you know, we, in the first couple weeks right there, when it's not really increasing, that's an, a full hiding. But then when it's going up this um, graph here, it's, it's transitioning from the hider, speech, uh, hider into a follower species. And then at 40, 50 days, it's a full follower. Now, if I jump back to that survival curve that I showed in my circle, kind of the, the same time length here, we again see from zero to 50 days, we really see that survival decrease. So during that hiding stage, and when fawns are transitioning from that hiding to following stage, they're most vulnerable to predation. You can see once they get to about 60 days of age, uh, there's actually not too many um, predations occurring. And actually many of these um, mortalities later in life tend to be health related in the winter. Um, so really interesting. Uh, and that'll be something we'll look at exploring a little bit later. One more just uh, interesting thing I, I think is interesting with this activity data. Um, again, we have time of day, so zero to 24 hours. And we have activity again on the vertical axis. And we see, you know, deer inherently crepuscular, right? So we, again, we see this at around 7 a.m. Right here, it tends to peak up. And then around 7 p.m., 8 p.m., we see another peak. Uh, and then lower troughs here in the middle of the day and then at night. And if we again look at things about predation and reducing risk, um, coyotes are, tend to be nocturnal. And you can see they're avoiding those times. And that is just another strategy to reduce overlap uh, when predators are most active. So in closing, uh, causes of fall mortality are mostly coyote mortality, with other important causes being health-related and vehicle collisions. Fawns are most vulnerable in those first 50 days of life when they're in the hiding stage, but also when they're transitioning to that following phase uh, because they're less mobile and still learning to evade predators while also being easier detected because they're up more and moving uh, following that mother. We see large annual variations in fawn survival, and we're gonna dive into those factors uh, which could be changing survival. Uh, some of the next things we'll be looking at is what factors of habitat and bed selection may help these spawns evade predator detection. Thank you uh, for your time today and I'll, I'll take any questions. Here's my co-authors and other acknowledgements as well. Awesome job, Tyler. Very interesting work. Um, so far we've got one question come in and it's from our friend Amber. And Amber wants her question, so the fawns are not sedated at all during the data collection process. Yes, that, that is correct. That is correct. One of the things, um, well, first of all, they're really docile in their, those first couple of weeks of life. So you could see when I went on that video and I put their, I put my hand on the phone, it didn't even move. And that's that's typical of probably 70% of the cases. They just really don't move. They're, um, they're quite, they're quite, you know, calm. Um, but sedation also brings in a lot of other risks, right? Like you have to sedate them and then you have to bring them back. And that, that uh, also allows long capture times. One of the things that um, our crew prides ourselves on is really fast capture time. So historically capture times last eight to 15 minutes in fawn captures. 
we really get it down. We try to get it down to three to five minutes. We're trying to get all of our important data, but we're trying to get it quickly and efficiently, like I said, so we can reunite that fawn with its mother or get back to be a better location. Because one of the things we don't want to do is just have, uh, you know, bring more attention where we could potentially bring a coyote in. So we really want to be as quickly as possible and, and get that information, but also, um, also get that fawn back bedded by itself. Cool. So the questions are rolling in now, and Richard wants to know, has there been an increase in the coyote population in the state? I've noticed more in my area, Elk River. Yes, there has. So that was actually one of the one of the reasons why we wanted to uh, begin one of these studies. So we take scent post survey, um, track surveys every year, um, the DNR does, all across the state. And you can look those up on the, on the DNR website. But um, in our region specifically, uh, we've seen you know large increases in coyote or coyote density, so r roughly 250 percent in the last 20 years. So the last time that study was conducted that I brought on, um, that was that was how long ago. And so that that was why we were really you know keen in on you know what is happening in this landscape. We really just don't know. And honestly, we, we weren't really expecting to find this much coyote predation. You know, we knew. Um, coyote predation would play the predominant factor because that, that is just kind of the case with uh, most ungulate species. They tend to be uh, most vulnerable to predation early in life. Okay. Uh, Carol wants to know, are hunters required to alert you if they kill a fawn um, that's been collared? Uh, they they are not uh, required, I guess, per se, but like we will find the collar, right? So it sends a GPS location wherever we're at. Uh, so we would know if they didn't, uh, but it's not, you know, there's no issue with um, shooting a, a GPS collar phone. And actually on the collar is uh, of my phone numbers on it. So they can give me a call. I can download um, all those, retrieve that collar and download those data, um, just get a little information on when the animal was killed. Um, but technically it's not required, but we'll, we'll likely be able to find the collar, um, regardless. Okay. Our next question comes from Jeff. Is this research showing some large dispersal changing the way we manage CWD? Um, yes, potentially. So fortunately in our area, this, um, CWD doesn't exist in Southwestern Minnesota. Uh, you know, it's mostly in southeastern Minnesota, but it is expanding quickly. And and I think it was the around two, 2017, 18, we conducted a, an additional study, a movement study in southeastern Minnesota, uh, looking at that specific those that specific question, looking at movement and how it guides um, CWD. You know, in that case, we saw again we saw large increases or large dispersals, you know, hundreds of miles, uh, some cases. So it definitely could shape the way. Uh, we manage deer. Unfortunately, you know, since we're seeing deer move this far, it changes in a negative factor, right? If you have, you know, your CWD uh, hotspot area that you're managing and you're um, collecting samples from, if you have a, a CWD positive deer that moves 100, you know, 92 miles like I had one of my fawns do, um, that obviously allows for some complications with um, managing for CWD and keeping that um, that disease like in that area. So. Um, but it definitely does. It just makes it more difficult, I would say, from the information that we're finding. Kathy was really paying attention during your presentation, and she noticed that you're wearing a uh, mask during the capture. Was that to minimize exposure to potential germs? Uh, that If we were wearing a mask, that was actually during, um, that might have been during COVID. Uh, that might have been why we were doing that. Um, we don't there's been no research to show that uh, there's been any transmission from you know, us to the deer. Um, one of the things we do is we always wear gloves. Um, you can see Mika Michaela and I both had gloves. She had clear gloves on, so it was a little harder to see, but um, she, we were both wearing gloves. We change those out each time, uh, so we don't take it from fawn to fawn. Uh, and like I said, we try to go quickly um, to reduce any sort of scent. I think that would be the the biggest factor is if we were able to put a lot of scent on the fawn, uh, a coyote could potentially um, key in on that because it smells different than what they're normal or what they normally smell. Mm -hmm. And fawns are are known to be uh, relatively scentless. 
Joan says, how does the mother find her fawn? So the mother finds the fawn as the fawn, uh, as the mother starts to approach, it lets out, uh, uh, you know, a, a belt and then the, the fawn will either get up or return a vocal sound and then they'll both kind of get up and key in on each other. And that is interesting too, because um, there's obviously something, there's something there with the vocal reasons, because as I mentioned, the mom isn't there when that fawn is, is bedded, right? So that mom, in many cases, I don't think even knows where the fawn is necessarily bedded. Or there's been uh, a couple cases where we do have the fawn get up and, or we complete a capture and we, the fawn bets down. But when we leave, we can see the fawn running away as well, because that fawn's quite mobile. It also probably wants to select a new bedside location, um, but we've never had, we don't really ever have any cases where um, that's causing issues with them reuniting in the future. So they're, <clears throat> they're keen in on something else other than, um, you know, a specific location where that fawn is bedded. Um, Okay. Um, Amber asked a question. Do you, could you share the region your study is taking place in? Southern, central, northern Minnesota. Yes, it's uh, southern, uh, south center of Minnesota. So it's like, if people know the location, it's like Mankato to New Ulm to Wyndham, all the way down, all the way down to the Iowa border. Um, that's the, the general area. Daniel asks, any reason the electronics are white instead of more natural colors to decrease visibility of the fawns, less predation? We have had some different colors of um, GPS colors in the past and just haven't really noticed any differences. Um, so I, I can't speak to that too much, but that, that, that could be something to be considered. Um, having to be brown um, to kind of key in and, and maybe make the same color. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> Jason was wondering, are there plans to do other surveys with drones? Pheasants, moose, wolves? Um, yeah, not that I know of, you know, I really, I really go in my um, deer area, but I know that the DNR wetland group up in Northern Minnesota is conducting some um, drone flights on um, ducklings. So they are doing that um, and that is happening. Um, the dr drones within the DNR are still kind of an evolving um, thing right now. So right now we hire out a drone contractor to complete all our work. Um, so that makes it a little bit more difficult. So we're trying to like, there's uh, actually a, a drone committee that's developed a, a, a group and they're trying to like figure out the next process or what the future will look like for drones within the DNR. So that could really open up um, a lot of different possibilities um, for many researchers to use drones, um, but it does, it is time consuming at this point because you have to develop a con contract and, and go through that whole process. Callie wants to know, are there any plans to expand this fawn research into the northern regions or northeast region? And is predation from coyotes a leading cause of mortality for fawns in the northern region too? To your knowledge, yep, there is not. Um, there's not a currently a plan to uh, have a fawn survival study in northeastern Minnesota. Although I have been um, contacted by a few people or within the DNR and also the University of Minnesota that have shown some interest in doing this work. Um, you know, one of the issues with using drones, for example, in a forested region is the amount of forest cover. And the drone thermal camera can't really penetrate through that um, flight uh, through that forest cover very well, so it, it could be difficult. But I do think it would be worth um, uh, you know setting, trying to uh, pilot study up there as well. And you may select areas that are more open within the forest, or you select forested areas. If you're calling in the spring, you could pick up some deciduous forest where maybe the, the leaf on hasn't occurred yet, so you could still see through um, down to the forest floor. Uh, I still think there could be a lot of possibility. Otherwise, the other way that you would do is you would GPS collar adults, and then you'd put vaginal implant transmitters in there. And then, as I mentioned earlier, when those are expelled, um, you know, a birth has occurred and you can go out and find that fawn and collar it. So that's a, another way you could do it. But I, there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of interest in, in starting a fawn study or even a, another adult study in the Northern uh, forest region. And then just speaking to predominant causes, it would definitely be um, wolves and then um, bears. 
you know, similar to the, the moose calf study that was conducted in the early, early um, 2010s, uh, that's what we saw. We saw like 71% uh, wolves, 10% uh, bear, and then other health related um, causes. Okay. And, and this just proves that great minds think alike. Carol threw a question in, any plans to do deer fawn study in other areas of the state? And I think you kind of covered that already. Um, Jeff came back with another question. What interest, training, or experience led you to wildlife research at the Minnesota DNR? It's a good question. So I went to the University, University of Minnesota and I didn't really know what I wanted to be uh, for a while. I, I thought about being a veterinarian when I was growing up. And then I got into meteorology for a little while. Um, but what led me to that is on the, the St. Paul campus of the U University of Minnesota, is I found uh, the wildlife program. So I kind of got into that, learned more about that, um, and became just very interested in, in that kind of uh, field. So that's kind of what led me, led me to go, go into that track. And then, you know, I got to do a couple of classes where I collared a bear, collared a couple of wolves, um, those type of things. And then, you know, your interest kind of grows. And then I um, began working on the moose study up in Northeastern Minnesota, um, and then, did a master's and then was able to get a position within the DNR um, after completing my master's. Wow. So I don't know if you and I talked about this. Um, are you a deer hunter yourself? I am. It's funny because yeah, I mean, I, uh, we always joke that we don't get to um, hunt much anymore because of the amount of CWD work that we do. So every hunting season, most of us are down in in southeastern Minnesota or wherever we need to be in the state. Um, I'm doing that work, so I would say I haven't really done much deer hunting in the last several years because I'm typically working. But everyone says I need to just take up bow hunting, so that might be that might be the play. But now I have two kids, so now I don't have much time other than that. It's and and, and it just goes to show. I mean, as deer hunters, we care about the resource and we work towards helping keeping that herd healthy and producing offspring. So I can't thank you enough for the work that you're doing down there. Yeah, thank you. Um, we're gonna wrap up here in a little bit. So if anybody's got a lingering question, feel free to get that put in. And um, yep, there comes one right there. What health problems besides CWD have you seen from Daniel? Um, they're almost always typically a bacterial infection that um, causes that are the causes of the mortality. Um, so clostidium, which is like a stomach flu, or we have salmonella uh, tends to be a cause. Uh, this spring we had one that was um, from a nematode, so a parasite uh, that was the predominant cause of mortality. So that's the also the beauty of t uh, being able to take our uh, whole carcasses up to the University of Minnesota. Um, because they're able to really culture all those samples, you know, liver, spleen, they can look at all of those that may um, hold that, hold the answer, you know, hold whether we have an infection or, or bacteria. That's something that in the field, you know, we can do a necropsy and look at for, for you know, rough causes, but it's really tough for us to, to key on specific health reasons. So that's one of the great, great reasons or great um, things we have at the University of Minnesota to help us with those questions. Very cool. Well, I, I don't see any new questions coming in. Tyler, I want to thank you so much for agreeing to come on and do this. We uh, heard about you through the, the wildlife school and that you did a similar program there. And uh, I think it's important for the residents to understand that, you know, it's not just left up to nature. We go in and try and uh, see what we can learn. And uh, we just had one question come in from Corey. Are you finding any correlation with the specific habitat types and fawn success rates? Uh, we haven't looked at, we haven't analyzed the habitat data yet. That's something we're um, really, really looking forward to doing pretty soon. So one of the reasons we, we haven't keyed in on that is, you know, we get the locations, but as I mentioned, we only get one location per day uh, and then Five other locations are stored on that GPS collar. So we're really waiting for us to retrieve all those GPS collars, um, getting all those location data, um, you know, formatted correctly, cleaned, and then we'll start looking at those um, 
habitat data, but, you know, habitat selection, for example, we want to look at, you know, what are they using in that first, you know, we, we are, we're already keen into those first 50 days, right? So we know that those first 50 days are really important to that fawn. So where are the surviving fawns hanging out? Where are the ones that were created upon early hanging out? What are the differences there? And then potentially we can use habitat management to increase those areas where fawns were surviving. Um, and then we can do that at, for later in the summer, uh, fall, during harvest, over winter. Uh, so we can answer all those different questions uh, to, to help out management in the future. So as sportsmen and conservationists, what's the one greatest thing we could do to help increase deer numbers through their first year of life? It's a good question. Uh, I mean, you could go to reduce the coyote population, or I think it really might key more in on to, on to habitat management, right? So, uh, you know, there's only a certain amount of grassland areas in the agriculture, for example. And so certain mothers are have better areas than other mothers, and they're able to select um, good bed sites, or not good bed sites, but they select good habitats for the fawns to select their bed sites. Well, the mothers over here that maybe have a little less, um, you know, quality habitat, they, those fawns may not have as much cover to hide away from coyote uh, predation. So just overall increasing habitat uh, across the landscape may help there be more areas for fawns to bed and uh, reduce the risk of being detected by coyote predation or coyotes in general. Awesome job. I, I'm gonna count that as our stewardship uh, point for this show, uh, create more wildlife habitat and help manage the predators. Um, like, again, I, this has been very interesting for me. I, uh, was lucky enough to see a doe and a fawn, uh, entering our property this morning. Um, I usually tell them to stay off the road when I see them. Um, but they, uh, they ran right across the road in front of my vehicle this morning on the way in. So we got a thank you from DC it says, uh, great presentation. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Got another thank you from Kathy. So anyway, um, Amber, if you can take us back to the green room and folks tune in next week for episode 121, The Art of Falconry.